I'm in Fremantle talking to Susanna Castleton and uh, Susanna. Hello. Hello. <laughs> uh, tell me, uh, tell me about your uh, about your work and uh, the I suppose underlying conceptual framework. Oh. Um, I guess it comes from an interest in the way in which we understand our place in the world. So I guess you go to mapping in that sense. So it, it derives from trying to work out how it is that we locate ourselves, but from a mapping perspective, I guess. But then with all good maps, it's all about sort of distortion and about um, the way that you know maps can lie and you know how they actually don't have the ability to show you where you are in the world in kind of a particularly accurate way. So it's kind of, I guess it's, it's, looking at the different processes in which we understand our place in the world and it, it goes from the sort of embodied experience of being on the opposite side of the world without knowing how you got there or from the actual pragmatic and practical approach to looking at an atlas and realising that you know that's where you're located right down to the phone in your pocket telling you where you're located. So yeah I guess it's about emplacement and the way you understand where you are and how you got there. Did your relocation from the UK to Australia mm -hmm. do you think impacts I suspect Sorry. so. I yeah. mean, we, I grew up on the road, really, travelling um, with parents who were, had serious wanderlust and did lots and lots of travelling with us. And um, we, we emigrated from the UK when I was very young and we did a year in Australia, a year in England, a year back. And so we went backwards and forwards lots. So right. my whole sort of formative years were um, between two places. But then, um, inventively, they sort of went by boat a couple of times and by train through, you know, Trans-Siberian Railway and they did it by car and so we were sort of, we were brought across the world from one place to another in quite unique ways, you know, right down to the fact that, you know, in the 70s mum and dad had a Land Rover with a map of the world on the side of it and they kind of plotted our track across through Afghanistan and Pakistan and so, you know, I guess in that sense it came from this absolute immersion in the world of travel. Um, so you actually, do you actually do that trip by road? Yeah. Oh yeah. I was only God. three, but hey. Yeah, but still, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that is just I incredible. remember the Trans-Siberian one, because I was coming back yeah. from England on a train all the way through kind of East, well, was East and West Germany then, well, West and East, um, mm. and then through Russia and to Vladivostok. Through Russia back in yeah. the days of the Soviet Union. Yeah, just yeah. after the, um, a couple of years after they'd had the Olympics in Moscow. So it was, wow. yeah. yeah. So I think that's, it comes from that, you know, love of or that immersion in travel um as a kid yeah. Yeah. yeah so obviously that predates um your decision to become a practice practicing artist mm. uh as the, has this always been a concern in your practice or has it emerged from ah somewhere else probably not you know i think through art school we all go through that angsty you know i want to make work about being a woman and you know <laughs> Feminism, you know, I think you kind of go through these phases that you feel like you should do yeah. um, at art school, and it probably wasn't until my on oh, no, maybe masters where I was in became interested in language and the way in which we kind of classify things and order things like the natural world and you know plants and animals and you know I became interested in I guess lexi the lexicon of the way in which we live and that automatically just transgressed into place naming and then bam you know it was suddenly this interest in geography and cultural geography so yeah it was I'm a slow learner I kind of it took me a long time to get to where I am now but it's yeah did you go to Kootenay yes yeah. oh, for my undergrad and my yeah, master's but PhD in Melbourne okay yeah to. yes yeah yeah, yeah. Other side. do you think the location of well you're actually in Fremantle but uh, Perth or WA uh, has had an impact in your um, concerns with mapping and I think geography. I did originally I used to you know kind of milk the fact that we live in the world's most you know remote capital city and you know I think probably in the first instance you know the fact you've got to mm. if you get on an airplane and go anywhere it's going to be at least you know three hours to get across any territory you know or across any um, border of, of the country so 
I think I'm interested in that expanded kind of spatial thing that we have being here, again, geographically. Um, but, you know, I think that's a bit of a furphy, that, you know, remote, you know, what is remote? So I think, it, I think I was interested in the geographical distance between places living here. Um, you know, I think the first time our kids ever went interstate, it was the longest flight they'd ever done or something. You know, it's kind of, it's, it's a long way from places and that's, I guess, interesting, but yeah, maybe not so much now. I mean, I love the fact that, you know, I know the opposite side of the world is Bermuda, you know, from where yeah, we are now. And yeah. if we dug a hole from Perth, we'd pop out quite close to Bermuda. You know, I like, I like locating my practice here, but it's not about West Australia per se, I don't think. Mm. Mm. And in fact, it seems to be, it seems to be more about um, the, how we psychologically deal with distance mm. in terms of mapping and also travel as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, and I love, you know, this work was part of sort of driving north, you know, getting on the Indian Ocean Drive and heading north and that kind of expanse of distance that you can sort of feel disappearing beneath your feet as you head, you know, again, that sort of idea of heading north is always holiday and like, you know, I like that, that the fact that you do have to go quite a long way to, to get, but then, you know, where we are, we get that beautiful change in the landscape quite swiftly really three hours north is quite different from three hours south which yeah. is very different from three hours east and of course very different from three hours west so i think we do have that quite uniqueness of yeah place are these uh are these lines off? yeah it's in yeah. the ocean drive so it's the, the main kind of drag that goes up the um it's kind of like the main tourist route heading north and these are the line markings that are down well they're not actually from the middle of the road because I was going to say. <laughs> um, well, I was actually interested in rest and pause. So I guess yeah. my interest in mobility and travel, um, you know, you'd look for its counterpoint or it's sort of the alternate. And I guess that's the stillness. And so these were actually the rest points on the drive north. So all of the, um, you know, the tourist sort of lookouts and tourist sites and the pinnacles and various sorts of notable um sightseeing site places on Indian Ocean Drive where they've got um, line markings so yeah that was but you know works like this they just um kind of part of the, my practice over the last you know three four years has been that I actually work out in the field and it's fraught with all of those things like wind and rain and so you make these you know things for hours in the studio that you cover with beautiful layers of gesso and sand them and buff them beautifully by hand and then you take it out to the Indian Ocean Drive where it's howling southwester and pissing with the rain and <laughs> you know there you are rubbing road markings and it's like wow that's, yeah which is all part of it you know they always look a bit beaten up and yeah so the environment is important. <laughs> um, a lot of the work that I've seen of yours um, is rubbing. Yeah. Um, can you tell me a bit more about your decision to use that technique, where mm. that came from, and what you think the effects of that might be? Yeah, it's a tricky one. Oh no, it's not tricky at all. It's <laughs> it has been a really, really strong part of my practice probably for the last four years, and I don't quite know how it emerged in such a kind of emphatic way, except I come from a printmaking background and I guess with most printmaking processes it's that sort of two steps forward and one step back, you know, you rub ink on, you rub it off, you print it. You. And so with this particular frottage process I use, I put layers and layers of gesso on first and then sand it back with sandpaper. So again, I think of them as more like prints, I mean I guess frottage is a print anyway, but so I think practically I've always been interested in overcomplicating things and you know why just get out a black pen and make a black mark on a piece of white paper when you can you know overcomplicate it by putting lots of layers of gesso on it. So I think practically it came from my um, interest in just sort of in trying to find out new ways of doing things. But then kind of conceptually it was very much based on a project that I did where I wanted to go to the other side of the world which is Bermuda. Um, and I did this sort of research project where I found out everything I could about Bermuda without going there. So I bought the souvenir postcards and I bought the you know, souvenir t-shirt and I bought the guidebooks and you can see them all lurking around the house, around the studio. Um, and I decided, and I web, looked at the webcams and I wrote all, read all the travel reports and so I want to try and get to know Bermuda without going there. This is a long way to get to your answer. Um, <laughs> and by doing that then, I thought, right, now I know Bermuda. 
I want to actually physically go to Bermuda to the other side of the world, but I don't want to know how I'm getting there or back. So a lot of it was about knowing and not knowing. So I embarked on this journey that was beautifully curated by my collaborator, Bevan, um, where he actually did all of the planning. Um, and all I said is I want to get to Bermuda and back without knowing how I'm getting there. And I want it to be in three weeks and I want to go on many modes of transport as possible. And so he so actually did the planning and didn't tell you? I did not nothing. So I just had to turn up to the airport and it was revealed that we were with Ho Chi Minh City. And you know, it was just, it was a mad and I only wanted to stay in different places for one day at a time. So it was just a frenetic pace, you know, Istanbul for a day and back out to, to Copenhagen for two days. And so it was just, it was mad. It was mm. terrifying. And um, yeah, it was, it was tough going because I'm a control freak and like to, <laughs> I like to plan these things. But it was about that not knowing. So anyway, that's another story. I won't say Just, that. just on, uh, oh, yeah. as an aside yeah. though, do you think that, um, because one of the things that I found interviewing lots of artists is that quite often uh, they will find ways of actually taking away the control. Yeah, it was absolutely that. Yeah. And I think because, you know, I've been interested in this whole idea of mobility and you know how we'd come to know the world and that we'd have so much access to knowing so much now um how do you undo that and almost go back to that call it childlike space of being dragged across the world in the back of a land rover by your parents you know how do you go back there and so this was a um an attempt at that unknowingness as a sort of an art practice as a as a as an experience so that was part of it but then i thought on my tr this trip around the world in three weeks, I really want to um, make a piece of work that in some way captures that sort of emplacement of being in Ho Chi Minh for a day and Istanbul for a day. And, and photography can do it because we know the indexical nature of photography, you know, it has that capacity. But again, I was kind of questioning that whole, you know, I think of, um, you know, the amount of images that you could download of Bermuda doesn't say you've been to Bermuda. So Frot Out came into play because it's, it is absolutely embodied. You have to be there on your hands and knees rubbing the grates of the, you know, of whatever place you're in um, as that sort of um, tangible, tactile, indexical nature of it. So it's, I saw Frot Out as being very much about that hands on the ground presence in the place. And so I did this piece of work that was 30 metres long and it was just, I did a linear metre a day of whatever I could find that was kind of long and flat. So it was, a, it, conceptually it's a very, I kind of like it, but it's a pretty weird looking piece of work. So it's like one great big long horizon line that, you know, goes for 30 metres and it's, you can sort of see it goes from a palm frond in Bermuda to a, a airport, you know, railing in Hong Kong. And it's, got, it's, it, it's kind of crazy. And then when I was actually in Bermuda, it goes all over the shop. But... So Frodo had really emerged from that, and again, I didn't know where I was going, so I couldn't anticipate that I was going to be in knee-deep snow in Copenhagen or, you know, pissing rain in New York City. So I had to sort of adapt that, um, I guess, the thing that I thought of that this work would be as I went. And again, you're jet-lagged and I had gastro and, you know, it was, it was mad and you just had to kind of adapt with this and this lump of massively heavy roll of paper that I carried around as hand luggage and... Because of course, because our itinerary was quite frenetic, so it was you know raising some eyebrows by the end with the customs officers. <laughs> anyway, so frot out to answer your question, um, that as a practice of being emplaced with something, whether it be a you know a, a railing in an airport or the New York City sidewalk grates or whatever, I became very fascinated by. Um, and it also means that you as a practitioner have to stop for a minute. You know, you, even though I was interested in mobility, as I was saying before, that counterpoint stillness, you actually have to stop and be in the presence of this thing. Um, and so that's what then led on to the works that are in the, um, the show in Span, which is where I actually wanted to work on stationary objects. So rather than me being the crazy mobile thing that went around the world, I actually wanted to find crazy mobile things that go around the world like aeroplanes and actually be in proximity to them stationary. Mm. And again, so the fraudage comes back into play because to actually be standing on an aeroplane wing for two weeks is a pretty remarkable thing to do. And again, frottage can capture that more so than maybe a photograph or a painting or a, I don't know. Scott, it was interesting the other day, that conversation about performance, but that's another story.
So yeah, I think frontage has become really, really important. And so things like this, you know, it is, it's that pause. We actually have to stop at these rest stops and, you know. And then I get uh, that going back to that indexicality of photography. I, I really enjoy the, the fact that you do see the marks of the wind where it's ripped it out of your hand or it's, mm. you know, these have got holes in them where the, the rivets of the aeroplane punctures the paper and, you know, so they've already got that tangible, tactile, haptic thing about being in a place or on an aeroplane wing. <laughs> what do you rub them with? Is it, do you send? Sandpaper. Right, yeah. So yeah, it's, um, and underneath them all, of course, to go back to the mapping thing, are mm. maps. So all of these ones here are all maps of the, the actual area that I drove up. So oh, yeah, you can see it's just kind of just there. Fire Chamberlain, and Wienu, Lagrange, yeah, Absol. Yeah. Um, and the ones of the aeroplane are on maps of the Great Sandy Desert. Again, that sort of, you know, I had to go to Arizona to a boneyard to find these stationary aeroplanes and I like that sort of being an Australian redundant map to a redundant aeroplane, you know, desert in Arizona. Mm. The interesting thing about that as well, I think, is you find yourself in the process in close proximity to, um, to a part of this machine that mm. we never really... I mean, as much as we air travel, we very rarely will actually get that close. Yeah, and I, I marvel at flight, you know, I still do. Yeah. And I just, uh, and I'm very, very keen on aeroplanes. <laughs> and I, so I'm fascinated by the actual objects themselves, but further, you know, I guess more than that, I'm interested in that whole experience of being in this place that is, so disconnected from the world and again I'm somewhat not good at flying but I do it because I you know it's part of the part mm. of what we do um but to actually sit on a wing or stand on a wing is pretty remarkable and you know sure pilots get to do it or aviation experts or mechanics or whatever they get to baggage handlers but it's quite a unique thing to do and um so to go to Arizona and I had aeroplanes galore um, to, to work on and, and do anything I wanted to with and it was just fascinating. It was, yeah, it's a very, very unique experience to be, yeah, and I guess that wonder of flight is just so seductive anyway, mm. I reckon. <laughs>